small point. Okay. I am now recording. Uh, if I may make one small point, um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm worried about a, my, of a, a naming issue. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, bind is part of ECMAScript, and now we're talking about introducing a bond function. No 007 jokes, please, but, <laughs> but uh, the naming is so similar that it, and, and for that matter, the purpose of the functions is relatively similar. It may confuse people a little bit, especially, I mean, the I and the O keys on my keyboard are right next to each other. You have I, a typo just waiting to happen. Yeah, so, um, so I'd like to get other reactions. My reaction is the fact that it's similar and different is actually good. Uh, because they're sort of about the same topic, so having uh, the names you know remind you of the topic, so that you know that it's kind of about the same thing but somehow different is is I think good. Yeah, um, yeah. Is it not a method call. It is a global endowment. Um, and could I also clarify one thing about the behavior of bond? Is it bind? Is it uh, returning a pre-bound instance uh, where uh, where in any method hanging off of the original OS is basically bound to that instance, or is it really a function uh, per function basis? Um, so let me try to take this from a different perspective. I, I had a bound function that basically proxified an object. So that any method I call from that object returns a bound uh, instance of that function to that particular object. Um, it's a cheesy way to not write a lot of bind statements, basically. So is that the behavior? Is it acting on the object? Or is it binding a particular function at that point? It's binding a particular function. But the, the caveat is that original OS and that particular dot in original OS is not necessarily a function. So if it's not a function, it just returns exactly what it was given. How about if it was an object with functions as methods? Does it do anything to those functions? It doesn't do anything further for the reason that uh, the attack that we're trying to avoid is when you create an object or an array in Jesse and you assign a function to one of the properties or one of the indices of the array of, or object, you can capture this from Jesse. So if you bond the if you bond the value before you assign it to the index, you're guaranteed not to capture this, and then it will just behave as normal. Okay, so it, it looks at whatever the this value is and gets you know, um, and 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 basically prevents this equals what it should never be. Right. Okay. So it, it was introduced to kind of have Jesse code reflect more the semantics of Python, where this is carried around all the time and you never miss by it. Okay. So, um, so I like this. In the alt OS and similar modules, we can just uh, say, for example, uh, release colon uh, well, actually, what you, what you wrote in the chat, um, uh, release colon bond original OS comma quote release unquote. Um, and uh, so do that for all the properties that we see the original accessed. Uh, that should typically not break anything. Um, and uh, uh, if the value of release is a non-function, then it doesn't get wrapped at all. It gets used directly. Um, and I think the goal for, for these, um, uh, for having uh, these manifests generated from Tofu uh, should only be that, that, the, um, that Tofu generates a sufficient approximation that many programs work. Uh, and uh, also a, a nice secondary goal would be um, when there was some reason why the generated manifest did not preserve uh, functionality, that things broke in a noisy manner, like with a thrown exception, which you would get if you were accessing an undefined when you expected a non-undefined.
Uh, Sala, I uh, saw your chat uh, message. How about unbind, i.e. never preserve this, this? Um, uh, I didn't understand what that meant. So, so um, like, I'm, I'm, think, I'm trying to find a good uh, function name because, like, I'm, I'm actually trying to understand the, the concept behind the function. Oh, 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 oh. So, you're, you're not proposing a new function. You're proposing a new name for this function. Yeah, um, like um, I'm, I'm struggling with the name, you know, reconciling the name with the behavior. Okay. Unbind is actually a good choice. Um, I thought about this for a long time, uh, and unbind was one of the ideas, but if it, if it satisfies most people, that would be better. If it feels intuitive to other people, because I tend to, like, things that feel intuitive to me are usually not intuitive, so... <laughs> But, but, you know, if, if more than one person feels that it's intuitive, uh, it's safer than, you know, me just saying, I prefer this, so let's go with it, right? So uh, I don't find it intuitive. Uh, if it was um, binding, taking the function and binding it's this to undefined, I would find the name unbind intuitive. But the fact that it's binding it this to something potentially powerful, um, I, yeah, I would not think of it as unbinding. Uh, we have 15 minutes left in this session. Um, I suggest let's file a ticket in the repository, spin it out, and okay. move on to something else temporarily except the bind name for okay. now. Okay. I'm sorry, bond name. Okay. Uh, Kate, um, can you project the uh, alt process? Because that's where we're uh, doing it with a global variable rather than a, um, uh, a, um, a module. Yep, one second. Okay. I have to step out, but thank you everybody for your participation. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Right, I should be projecting. Okay, so this one um, uh, is given permission by, yeah. Okay, so here's the pure attenuator uh, that, again, uh, we generated this um, uh, by just taking a look at all uses of the variable in the module in question uh, and just extracting out the properties um, that we saw being accessed with dot on that variable and also seeing that the variable again was not used in any other way. Um, uh, I like um, you know, Michael's suggestion that the things that should be on the right of the colon are calls to his bond thing, um, uh, which, shouldn't, which uh, um, should do better at preserving um, the original behavior while still um, uh, enforcing the least authority we're trying to enforce. Um, and, um, and then the uh, wiring that we saw with this was that alt what was it? show me alt process again. Alt process. Okay, so it takes. Ah, uh, uh, right, right, right. It's, um, uh, it's creating a record saying, use this the result of attenuate process as the global variable named process for things that should get a global variable named process from this alt process module, which is then what the uh, manifest says to do. Um, and so this whole manifest processing is also consistent with all of the modules being evaluated only once, um, uh, um, which is why we had this extra level of indirection with regard to the, to the global variable names uh, in the manifest. Uh, so does this seem like 
uh, a good target. And in particular, if we go to create a packager for preserving the CES module semantics, uh, that taking an existing packager and mod modifying it so that it consults the manifest and then wires things according to the manifest should be a reachable goal. So I do have some concerns here, okay. uh, a variety, uh, part of which was using a package manager. Uh, and these may not be fatal, but they're still concerns. Okay. Um, one is, uh, I do not want this to be within the application directory ever. Uh, due to a variety of attacks in the common case scenario of leaving your application directory with writable file systems. Okay, so, so l l let me... Um... So I thought about that. I remember the, this whole sub-resource integrity thing, and I'm a little confused about the threat model. If the adversary has read-write access to the file system, then it can replace the, the part of Node that's doing the checking. Um, uh, node does not expose that is a file. Well, they would need to completely replace the executable, which for Docker containers, if you have multiple layers, the layers above you are usually non-writable. Uh, 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 so I'm not that familiar with Docker. Uh, when you talk about layers with Docker, is, is this um, like a, ch a Cheroot relationship between the file systems? No, it is a actual... Uh, full implementation of a different file system with multiple layers. Um, so, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, the, the key point is the application directory usually does have write access within its uh, subtree, oh. but usually things external to that are not writable. So the, the application normally has writable access to the directory containing the code for the application? Correct. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Some of them come down to the usage of just-in-time uh, compilers for alternative languages. When it's, it's generally not required, it's just how uh, applications, when they're deployed to the cloud, generally work as they exist today. Okay, so the so if the application modifies its source code, um, uh, the goal of your sub-resource integrity thing is to catch that. Um, uh, does do you also do apply the sub-resource integrity to the uh, package dot lock file? Uh, we apply it to all resources loaded. If anything goes through a code loading uh, path, has an integrity check applied. So why Due to that, why OS that... limitations, C++ modules do have a race condition, though. Okay. So, so why doesn't the same sub-resource integrity apply to this manifest? It could apply to this manifest, but it's already a manifest file. So why would we have two? This gets into my next point. Um, I don't want this in package.json for another reason. Um, this applies great if you treat package.json as only for the top level of your application, but you could have conflicting forms of these manifests within your node modules directory. That's why I kept saying package.lock.json. Uh, you could still have problems there because things do ship package lock files. If package lock is shipped in a module, is it that if, if application A uses module B, does the B package lock file get consulted at all? Uh, that varies slash depends. In general, no. So usually Even if package B, which is contained within package A, 
has a package lock file, for the most part, it is ignored if you perform the installation at this site of package A. Okay. So it's usually the top level package lock that matters. Yes. So how does that differ from what we have in mind for the mat for this manifest? Once again, we're down to we generally do not want to put this in our application directory. Okay. So let me let, so where do, where do you suggest we put it? We can put it anywhere that has some semblance of uh actually being, you know, marked as sensitive, please do not ever write to this. But that is not what the application directory is used for. So the, the, the application as a download from NPM has to contain this, you know, this policy because the application that knows what the least authority is of the modules in the application so where, so, so we're going to get to another thing. Uh, when we download things off NPM, if the intent here is to trust the registry, give the proper amount of authority, I have more concerns. When you say there are ways to have different things presented from the NPM registry from what was pushed up to the NPM registry. Right. I think we're counting that as a separate concern that, you know, is certainly something that we need to be concerned about, but not something that we're trying to tackle okay. here. I mean, the kind of the kind of file you would be getting from NPM, uh, you, you, you know, in, so, in a more secure scenario where we're not depending on NPM, uh, we either get that file from somewhere that we have more crust in, or we get a hash of the file from somewhere we have more crust in, and then check the hash against the thing that we get from wherever. Um, uh, but still, the thing that we're getting is the kind of file we would have gotten from NPM, but it contains this policy file for handing least authority to the modules within it. But I do want to be sure that we have a relative uh, sense of disconnect here because automatically trusting something because it downloaded is not my goal. So, so, yeah. so forget the manifest. I'm, I'm just confused about what the scenario is that you're, that, that, that you're trying to support. Where does an application come from? The application source code can come from NPM, but its authority does not come by merely downloading it okay. off the register. The, 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 this... How does an application get installed? Did you hear Brian's question? In, in, in your world, in this, in this scenario, how does an application get installed? So what I've been working with, with our policy files and the PR I landed, roughly what happens is you download something without using any install scripts, and then you run a process on it if you do not have the actual already audited uh, manifest that matches the integrities of the files contained in your download. No install scripts have run yet. That gets actually checked, and you get prompts of this is about to use FS, OS, whatever. And then you can use it from a different store from the uh, source code and store it in a different location from the source code. Just downloading something is not grounds for arbitrary grant of privilege. Okay. Is I, I, what I, I'm worried about. So I, I, I didn't understand that, but before I ask you to, to explain again, let me, let me focus in on um, a, a question or observation. Um, 
I think we might be solving two different problems that are related and need to be chained together, but they're still distinct problems. It sounds like the problem that you're trying to address is giving the application least authority uh, by some policy expressed somehow outside the application that is about the application. And that's certainly an extremely important thing to do, but that's not what I'm trying to do here. Um, the, uh, and, and it would not have been adequate, for example, in the event stream incident. The event stream incident, the application as a whole, needed the authority um, uh, to do the uh, Bitcoin wallet thing. Uh, what I'm trying to do is to have the application author express and maintain a policy for how the authority granted to the application is then subdivided among the modules that make up the application. If it is merely a request and not a grant, that seems fine. Uh, no, it's a grant. It's, it's, let's take the event stream thing again. I do not consider applications to be able to grant themselves authority as adequate. Well, I, 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 I'm, say, I'm saying it's a separate problem. I'm not saying that it's adequate, but I'm saying we shouldn't confuse the two problems. And the two problems compose together into something more powerful. Um, so can I ask a question that, because I, I think I see uh, what you're trying to uh, point out, Mark, um, uh, and maybe I'm wrong, but you're saying that uh, the application should control the trickle down of authority granted um, by other means within its own module. So it doesn't really uh, award um, authority just by, by granting it. It only trickles down authority it is allowed uh, by outside means uh, right. within its own scope. And that's exactly right. So, so Bradley, I think um, it's not that this example is meant to uh, say that the, the application should have all authority. We could definitely limit that. It's just that this example only focuses on given the authority that the application does have, how do we attenuate that to the modules that it wants to import? Yeah, this this is the thing that I'm I'm trying to illustrate when I do the the um, the talk slides with the 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 Menger sponge, uh, where I'm rec you know I'm showing how powerful it is to recursively attenuate authority at every level of composition and how those com how how doing it at every at every granularity. Uh, composed together to give you a multiplicative overall reduction in authority. But the imposing a policy on the application so that the application as a whole is given limited authority, I think should be kept as a separate expression of policy than the internal application authored policy of how the application's authority gets further subdivided among the modules that make up the application. And this, this manifest is trying to solve the second problem. If that is the problem you are trying to solve, uh, it seems okay to put it in package JSON, but I am skeptical of this approach. So this is the so so clearly there's been a disconnect because from the beginning this is the approach that I thought all of us were talking about and this is the approach for which I find the tofu approach to be extremely useful. Um, so uh, what is it you're can you say what you're skeptical about with regard to this approach? So my skepticism comes down to uh, roughly the auditability of this in the event stream incident, which I guess is our canonical incident, we would have seen that we have flat map stream being pulled in by event stream. I don't think that would have been a red flag. 
And then we would have seen that flat map stream actually is requesting access to uh, the file system. It doesn't actually request access to um, what, what was it called? The Bitcoin wallet. Um, so it only looks like it's been granted file system access. So, so granting, um, you know, the, the, if the Tofu tool had been run uh, on the Bitcoin wallet uh, before um, uh, FlatMap, before it was corrupted by the uh, adversary, um, and then uh, the adversary had created an upgrade of the event stream, uh, as they did, that depends on flat, uh, flat map or whatever it is, flat stream, uh, that in turn depends on the file system. The, the purpose I took it of the whole tofu policy generation thing is exactly that uh, that new re authority um, request would get flagged. Um, uh, in if um, it, if the the application author just runs, I mean, if the application is using the file system, um, uh, but just this module isn't, and now the application continues to run the file system, I don't understand how you would expect the system you have in mind to catch it. So we would both catch it, but we're doing it from different perspectives. Uh, from my perspective, it is not the application which should be in control of uh, how its authority is handed out to child processes and specifically to specific source codes. Um, source texts, sorry. Uh, it is a grant by the person running the application instead. I think you can have both. It's kind of the equivalent of having um, uh, like a sub banking account or something like that that only is given a hundred dollars and is able to decide what it does with that. There, there's, like, a ma there's a maintenance problem here that really scares me. Uh, if I change my application so that the application as a whole is not using any more authority than it used to, but I just change my internal logic so that I've just refactor my application internally into different modules that are wired up differently, then in the system, Bradley, that I think you're describing, my refactoring of my application where the application as a whole is not using anything that it, that it did not previously use, that would be flagged to the user and a user that has no idea what the meaning is of internal modules within, in my application, he just wants to use my application as a Bitcoin wallet, he's now going to be asked to make a policy decision about which modules inside my application should be getting which authority. So that's a user experience question. That's not actually a maintenance question. In general, I would expect the user experience for the average case to be a cascading effect. No matter how deep a dependency is, if it uses FS, it bubbles up however many levels generally to the application. But, but there are lots of parts of the application that should be using FS. Correct. So I, so I don't, I mean, the user experience issue and the maintenance issue to me are inseparable. It's a question of where the policy decision is made I think having the user make a policy decision with regard to the authorities granted to the application as a whole is appropriate and in fact uh, corresponds to the user experience on things like iOS and Android. Um, uh, having the user be asked to make policy decisions about internal modules of the application 
when the application as a whole is using the same authorities, that to me seems unreasonable. I would agree, and I would not propose such. Okay, then I don't understand what you're proposing. I'm proposing when the user grants the authority, it is stored in a manner for the user, not for the application's author, roughly. Then when the, when the application's author refactors their application such that a module that did not previously use FS is now using FS, but the application as a whole had already been using FS, what happens? I expect that the overall authority grant is the same through whatever cascading means okay. that you aggregate it. And so the user only sees the top level. So it doesn't matter what modules are using FS. It just knows that this application is using FS. But the stored values do correspond with the exact modules that are granted that permission. So who... Who sees the flagging that a module that did not used to need to use FS is now using it, and who gets to make the policy decision that that is okay? In general, this would be hidden from the average user. This would likely come down to security audits. So, so once again, who, where would the flagging happen, and who would make the decision? Anybody who's wishing to run in a more restrictive mode than the average user. So people who do security audits are going to be wanting to know the exact changes that happened within your application, which is not the average case for the average user. Could the I... person who does a security audit should be able to run in some mode that sees the exact changes of, oh, that file has been deleted. That file does not use this authority anymore. This file does use more authority now. Okay. We definitely I... have conflicting scenarios in mind. Um, I think... I think requiring a security audit on behalf of the users and requiring users to use policies that emerge from the security audit. Uh, no, 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 no. There is no required for security audit. I am just saying you asked a very specific question about where this flagging does occur. It is stored. All the permissions that are given for these powerful primitives need to be stored. I think I think we're in agreement there. I think there's kind of there's a pipeline that trickles down, like Sala was saying, of uh, of authority, and there there's the set that the user gives the application. Then there's the set that the application gives to specific mo modules that it imports. And it sounds like Bradley, you're focused on the user perspective, which we haven't focused on yet, but that really needs to be focused on. But but the difference is that. Bradley wants the policy of which modules within the application get which authority to, to be, be pinned when the user authorizes it, yes. Yeah, and therefore, uh, in order to use a refactored application uh, that makes use of, that, that does not make use of any further external authority, uh, would require a decision that comes from the user, um, either a decision made by the user or made by the security auditors that the user is subcontracting to. Uh, sorry, could I uh, just add one one aspect that, that we might want to consider? Um, if if um, as, uh, the statements, if we, if we keep a diff um, like a record of the occurrence of um, um, you know authority calls, like calls to FS. Not only do we keep the module in line, we actually store the three or five lines surrounding the call. Um, and if if 
even if it moves to a different module, a flag comes if those lines change, you know, without comments in white spaces, change drastically. But, but so, so, ha so flagging changes, uh, I think we're all in agreement with, but the question is flagging changes to whom and where does the policy to allow the refactoring, where does the policy decision to allow the refactoring come from? So for me, there is no prompt to the user if the overall ambient authority doesn't change for an application. So you can refactor as many modules, remove add modules, as long as overall aggregate authority used within the entirety of the module space. Uh, if, if I'm understanding what you mean by aggregate authority, that's really coarse, right? Like it uses the it file is. system or it doesn't use the file system? Correct. This is roughly what you see on mobile uh, today, what you see in browser when you click, hey, do I want to enable okay. uh, location features? Okay. So, um, we, so we are in agreement on that being what the user should see. Now, I don't understand what scenario you have in mind about the policy file that is uh, under the user's control, not under the application's author's control, where that policy file is expressing authority regarding individual modules within the application. So, Roughly, this is a guard against exactly the rewrite of read Solomon encoder.js. So it's an example file in the node policy CLI. Roughly, what happens is you get into a situation where a file gets uh, marked as having some level of authority. And if it gets rewritten, we don't want it to get more authority. And so we're pinning that when the user approves, hey, I want to give location access to my app, we're not approving, hey, all future versions have location access granted to all possible permutations. We're saying within this current module graph, we've granted it. If you change the module graph, it is visible that that grant has moved from one file to a different one. But how? But when you say it's visible, um, the user... The user wouldn't see it. I'm sorry? You would, the user experience would never let you see it. It would be okay. under an audit of some kind, or you could do it for an author okay. when they are uploading. Okay. A, so, 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 um, so when you say... So I'm trying to understand how this loop through the audit works from the user's perspective. The user has some policy file that came from the auditor. The user now upgrades a particular application. The application is internally refactored, but its aggregate authority is the same. The user, without upgrading its, his policy file, now gets a failure and, ha and the user now has to go back to the auditors for the auditors to inspect the refactored application. Is that what you have in mind? That is what I wish to enable. I do not think that would be the average case though. Wait, is the average case one that doesn't involve an auditor at all? Yes, that's the average one that we see on mobile today. That's what we see in browsers today. This is generally what you see in even the Apple App Store on your Mac today. We do essentially have reason to want the application to fail if it's refactored without our knowledge. Okay, I don't. Um, I think that um, the responsibility for the, for the internal distribution of authority should be on the application author. Um, if the user wants an upgraded application to be something that's, that's approved by the security auditors, the user can do that anyway. 
um, uh, the security auditors might be looking at the new code as well as the new authority grants. Uh, the fact that the authority grants are in a manifest that's declarative as part of the application helps the security auditors, but the what that distribution of internal authority is should be considered part of the process of authoring the application. Can I point out uh, something um, that might be helpful? I think um, similar to how the modules that we're importing may or may not get the actual OS or whatever authority it is, the application may or may not get um, what it thinks it's getting from the user. So there could be a decoupling there um, where if the user doesn't give uh, access to FS, the application thinks it's getting access to FS, but it doesn't actually. And so um, the what the user expresses doesn't have to be uh, expressed exactly in the uh, application manifest. There could be a disconnect and that's okay. The, so, uh, 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 Kate, I'm not sure, um, when, you, when, you, we, the, when you say the application manifest, we now have, uh, because of these two different scenarios, uh, two different things you could mean. Uh, there's, some, there's something authored by the application author and that's the manifest that you and I have been working with. And then there's a manifest or policy file or something that is not in control of the application author, that is in control of these security auditors, um, that is about the application and imposing uh, uh, restrictions on the application. Um, right. So, uh, so... By that, what I mean is, um, sorry, I think my cat's coughing in the background. Um, the, the policy may grant or not grant FS, for example, the policy uh, file, but the application, what the application sorry, developer wrote may okay. assume that it gets FS. Okay. By the uh, policy file, we're talking about the policy file that expresses the user's policy right. for the so, application as a whole. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the user policy file uh, can be completely decoupled from the application pol or the application manifest that the application developer writes, and uh, so so whether or not the user grants uh, authorities, uh, you know, it could the user could virtualize authorities in the in the user policy file or something like that. And in the similar in the in a similar fashion to how the modules that we're importing may or may not get the authorities that they think they're getting, okay. the application itself may or may not get the authorities that it thinks it's getting. But that's okay; it doesn't change what the manifest that the application developer writes is. Okay, good. That that all makes sense to me, and is in fact you know very much fits with what I have in mind. Uh, the app, the the uh, the outer virtualization of FS. Uh, um, is would be expressed in, in terms of, um, uh, I think, you know, corresponds to the locus of responsibility that uh, Bradley's talking about. It's imposed on the application. And then the further virtualization of FS among the modules of the application would be virtualizing the, F, the you know, additional virtualization, additional attenuation that's on top of the attenuation of the FS that's granted to the application as a whole. Right. So a good example might be uh, the user only wants to give this application a certain subdirectory, and the application um, thinks it's getting the whole file system, but it's actually just getting the certain subdirectory that it can do whatever it wants with. Okay, good. So that seems to satisfy mine. So I have no complaints if you want to split it after that point. So if you want to virtualize again within your own application, that's fun. Uh, and to do it within logic that is part of the authored application. 
Uh, yes, because you have already been able to uh, manage the authority that the application can obtain in total. Okay, so okay, so good. That's 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 the mission that that I was hoping we were on. Um, that the that the policy imposed on the application from the outside is with regard to the authority given the, to the application as a whole, including virtualizing FS, and then it's part of the authored application to express further subdivisions and virtualizations of those among its own modules. Uh, that seems fine. I, I haven't really been going for that direction, so I'd need to think on it, but I can't find any problems off the top of my head. Okay, excellent, excellent. So now let's go back to uh, Kate's manifest and thinking of the manifest as something that is according to the author of the application and considered part of the application. Uh, uh, from that perspective, with regard to the question you originally asked, is there any reason for this manifest that is purely about that internal further subdivision of authority? Is there any reason for this manifest to be anywhere other than uh, within the um, uh, directory tree of the code of the application? No, and I'll take it even a step further. If if we've if I understand our division here, um, the application itself uh, should be able to completely uh, overwrite. I I don't have a good word. Uh, intercept the module system as a whole. And that's what we're trying to do with these loader mechanisms for Node. Mm -hmm. And so not just your manifest here, which is a little specific, uh, but it should essentially have control over the module system entirely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is our goal uh, with loaders. Right. So yes, you can keep this in your application directory. That seems fine. Okay, and then um, the applying the all the mechanisms that we've been talking about in this group, in order to actually subdivide the authority within the application as expressed by this file, is still a worthwhile goal that 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 we're working towards, and uh, you know the and is a, is a good place to start, um, uh, even if we want to end up with something much more expressive than that. Yes, and I can give a more concrete example here. Um, if you are talking about supports color here, um, you are rewriting OS. Um, Alt OS, for example, instead could be rewritten in such a way that it hard codes a value and therefore removes the overall authority used, yeah, but so that, still that, allows your application to work. Yeah, that's, exa that's exactly what the Alt OS that you were looking at does. That's, that's exactly what yeah. we had in mind. Yes, so this, this makes sense to me. Great. It's a way to make your application work when your imposed restrictions so in this case, you don't want your application to request OS to access because you feel it's not actually needed. Therefore, you can create a version of your application which does not use OS. Correct. So yes, okay, good, good. Uh, okay, so, um, so, so now that we have clarified the, the different purposes the different policy expressions can have, does it also seem reasonable that the file we're looking at uh, could be automatically generated from the information produced by your Tofu tool? We could certainly produce a minimal version of what is used, but uh, actually removing the powerful primitives seems difficult. 
for example, here, going back to OS, we could show the application author, oh, you're only using OS in this one case. Maybe you don't need it. Um, so they, but I don't think we can actually provide values that would uh, make it so these powerful primitives are not accessed, if that makes sense. Uh, no, I did not understand that. Let, let me, let's talk about this particular example. Um, uh, the idea is that we have an application that was already, you know, together with a set of modules that was already written that uses the name OS, thinking that it's accessing the, the powerful OS primitive, but the Tofu tool recognizes that OS is only used in a very constrained manner. Uh, it's only used as the, on the left side of a dot, um, uh, and then it generates something like this manifest um, together with the, the let's say the let, let, let's take the entire scenario where it does the um, the the um, uh, property name uh, attenuation. Uh, it generates this um, to where the uh, the author of the application. Um, uh, now sees this as something generated that enables the author to impose that when su that supports color still uses the name OS, but when it uses that name, what it sees bound to OS is the module created by AltOS. Um, Can we take a look at that source code for that module again? Yes. I guess we really want attenuate OS because... So we, we do get passed in a powerful primitive here. So, so not necessarily. This could, this could be an OS that has already been attenuated to only include what the application as a whole needs. So what are your expectations for, uh, what are your expectations for an author to see listed as what is used? What we're looking at. I would say the author of the application sees this as the expression of the internal further reduction of authority within the application. Uh, and uh, then with regard to the policies of how the application as a whole has its authorities reduced. Uh, it might be similar to this, but it wouldn't be this itself. I think we should also mention that this is specifically the legacy approach. So this isn't necessarily the ideal way that you would want to specify things, like maybe you don't want an OS module at all, but we're trying to fit into what the current code is using. Yes, um, we can certainly generate a lot of this, this style code. Um, the further step of not using any original OS and using hard-coded or pure censorship uh, might be more difficult, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so in the other, the sibling repository to legacy to do, um, uh, we, we went and did the invasive rewriting of supports color and chalk into the you know wyvern uh, or e pure style um, and uh, and that's what we would prefer people do long term but it involves a invasive rewrite of of basically everything that's not pure and uh, for that one the the main um, uh, uh, does um, 
the you know calls the attenuators itself and passes things through as uh, parameters. Uh, we could probably generate either way for a, a sizable amount of static cases, not all of them. Uh, either direction seems doable. Um, the larger rewrite like this would uh, probably confuse authors, I think. Yes, I agree. Um, uh, so, my, so my inclination is to focus our effort on supporting the legacy approach. Uh, yes, we can, we can generate those files, but if people want to remove reliance on powerful primitives uh, entirely, they would need to do uh, that manually. I can't, I can't generate something that would allow that. Great, great. Um, I think, I think we're, we're in sync again. Okay. Well, I am going to need to go. Okay. Uh, but Mark, before I go, uh, I apologize for hijacking this for a second. Uh, we do need to sync up on decorators sometime. Ah, so, yes. Uh, because that is seeking stage advancement next week. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. If there is nothing else, uh, I can kind of think about this topic of the author-driven policies and probably come back with a better formed thought on Thursday. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to stop the recording now and adjourn, um, and I will be uploading both recordings. Apologies for the second phase of the meeting, uh, that the first half of that second phase did not get recorded because of a um, uh, error I made in trying to operate the recorder. Okay. No worries. All right. Thank you. Yep. Brad.